There are so many things to consider when choosing your investing strategy, from the long-term returns to the short-term volatility, as well as your own goals and tolerance for risk. One of those goals for many investors is to reach and make the most of financial independence. Today we're going to be going over what I consider to be the three biggest keys to making the most of this goal, as well as how you can better optimize your portfolio for financial independence, whether you're still putting money away or are already getting ready to transition into the next phase of financial life. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. And if you want to further support this channel, you can check out some of the links I've left in the description below, which includes a link to my Patreon page. This is the best way to show your support for this channel, and in addition to that, you can also get early access to new videos and exclusive content such as spreadsheets based off the ideas we discuss in these videos. The spreadsheets will allow you to play with your own numbers and see how big of a difference some of the ideas we discuss can make for your own personal financial situation. When it comes to financial independence, the general rule of thumb that's thrown out the most is that in order to be considered financially independent, you need to have something in the neighborhood of 25 times your annual expenses saved up in your nest egg. This rule of thumb comes from something called the Trinity Study, conducted by retired financial advisor William Bengen. In it, he found that an investor with a well-diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds could reasonably expect to be able to withdraw at least 4% of their nest egg in the first year of a 30-year retirement, with subsequent adjustments for inflation in future years, without running out of money. However, while that 4% minimum safe withdrawal rate is a good starting point to use for many investors, it's not like it's a universal truth in all situations. There are a few things that could change the amount of money you can safely withdraw from your nest egg. The first is the future returns of your assets. Some people feel that investment returns in the future will be quite a bit lower than what we've experienced over the past century. If that ends up being the case, then maybe a more conservative 3% withdrawal rate would be better. The second is the specific asset allocation that you're invested in. The Trinity study assumes that a mixture of stocks and bonds was used, but if you're fully invested in stocks, which tends to be a lot more volatile in the short term, or you're including other types of assets like real estate, gold, or even cryptocurrency, then your safe withdrawal rate will likely be a bit different because the growth and stability of your nest egg will be a bit different. The third is your own personal inflation rate. We can't know for certain how our personal expenses are going to change over time, but if we have good reason to expect that our expenses will grow significantly faster than, say, the overall rate of inflation, we may want to adjust our safe withdrawal rate downward, or vice versa if we expect our expenses to rise at a slower rate than overall inflation. Therefore, from the perspective of choosing an investing strategy, when it comes to making the most out of financial independence, we need to keep three major things in mind. The first thing we need to keep in mind is that in order to maintain a safe withdrawal rate that's as high as possible, we need to dedicate a substantial portion of our money towards investments that will bring us good long-term growth. This is key during both the accumulation and drawdown phases of our financial journey. It's key in the accumulation phase because if you can safely withdraw 10% of your nest egg each year and you want to live on $50,000 a year, you'll only need to save up $500,000, as opposed to the $1.25 million that you'd need to have stashed away under the original 4% rule. And obviously it's key in the drawdown phase because it allows you to generate a larger income on the same amount of savings. The second thing we need to keep in mind is that we need to dedicate a modest amount of our money towards investments that will bring stability to our returns in the short term. Generally speaking, investments that tend to have better long-term growth prospects also tend to be more volatile in the short term. And the last thing we want to find ourselves doing is withdrawing money from a nest egg that's lost 50% of its value over the past year. That'll make it a lot tougher for the nest egg to recover from the downturn before we run out of money. And the third thing we need to keep in mind is that we need to dedicate a modest amount of our money towards investments that will protect us from sudden onset and sustained levels of high inflation. If we can do those things, if we can generate strong long-term returns without totally killing ourselves in the short term, while ensuring that our expenses don't significantly outstrip the growth in our portfolio, we'll be able to significantly increase our safe withdrawal rate and reach financial independence sooner. With that being said, how much of an improvement can we really make here? Let's find out by tackling each of these keys individually. The first key to maximizing our safe withdrawal rate and minimizing the time it takes to reach FI is to dedicate a substantial portion of our money towards investments that will grant us strong long-term growth. Historically speaking, out of the traditional investment assets like stocks, bonds, cash, gold, other precious metals, and real estate, the best ones for sustained long-term growth have usually been stocks or real estate. However, since I only have data on REITs going back to the early 1970s, I'm going to be using stocks as our long-term growth investment for this video, so that we can test our strategies going all the way back to before the Great Depression. So let's see how much an investing strategy that focuses on long-term growth fares against a strategy that doesn't by comparing an all-stock strategy represented by an S&P 500 index fund to the much more conservative permanent portfolio, which puts 25% of its money toward a total stock market index fund, long-term treasuries, cash, and gold. We'll look at data going all the way back to 1920. 
2027. Based on the data I have available to me, and assuming a 30-year drawdown period with expenses that rise at the same rate as inflation, as measured by the CPI, if we were to look at every possible starting year since 1927, someone investing in the permanent portfolio would have a minimum safe withdrawal rate of around 3.14%, before investment expenses and taxes are taken into account. Over a 40-year period, that rate falls to 2.57%, and over 50 years, it drops to 2.31%. If we want to maintain our original principle all the way through to the present day, then that withdrawal rate, which I'll be referring to as a perpetual withdrawal rate for the rest of this video, would fall to below 2% all the way down to 1.91%. Based on that 30-year safe withdrawal rate, that someone would not have achieved financial independence if they were investing 30% or less of their income each year. Even when saving 50% of their income for retirement, the numbers don't look as promising as we'd like. They do reach a buy-in around 71 of the possible starting years, or about 75% of the time, but on average it takes them roughly 50 years to do so, which admittedly is not necessarily a total deal-breaker, as some people do spend around 50 years in the workforce, but still, if you're saving that much of your money, you'd hope to reach FI quicker than that. If that same someone had instead invested all their money into a more growth-focused S&P 500 index fund, the figures would look considerably better. The 30-year safe withdrawal rate would come in at around 3.45%, with the 40- and 50-year scenarios not too far behind it, at 3.32% and 3.21% respectively. The perpetual withdrawal rate even clocked in at 3.07%, which is a considerable improvement for those who don't want to have to dip into their principles. They'd have also reached FI far more frequently. Even with just a 15 or 30% savings rate, they'd have reached it in 26 and 64 of the possible starting years, or 27 and 67% of the time respectively. And as you'll see on this chart, at the higher levels of saving, the average time it takes for them to reach FI is significantly cut down from what we saw with the permanent portfolio. Now granted, part of the reason that there's such a wide disparity between these two approaches is that the price of gold was largely fixed until about the 1970s, which means that a quarter of the permanent portfolio investor's money was going towards something that was not growing, or falling, for a good portion of those years. If we were to look at the permanent portfolio since the 1970s, its FI metrics would look a lot more respectable, but it does serve to illustrate the importance of long-term growth to making the most out of financial independence. Some investments do struggle for extended periods of time, so it's entirely possible to experience similar outcomes to what we saw here, even if none of the investments are being artificially held constant. The second key to maximizing our safe withdrawal rate and minimizing the time it takes to reach FI is to dedicate a modest portion of our money towards investments that will bring stability to our returns in the short term. We all know that over the long haul the stock market has produced pretty strong returns, but we also know that in the span of a handful of weeks it can drop 30% or more. So consistency and short-term stability of returns is not a strong suit of most all-stock portfolios. The most common way investors attempt to bring some consistency to portfolios that are primarily invested in stocks is to add bonds. So let's compare how a classic 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio would stack up to our all-stock strategy. The specific funds that I'm going to be using for the classic 60-40 approach is a total stock and total bond index fund mixture. That way we're nice and diversified across both asset classes. And as you can see from the data on your screen, it does improve upon the all-stock approach in terms of minimum safe withdrawal rates for all four durations. However, it does give up a little bit on the accumulation side of the equation, reaching FI slightly less frequently and over longer time frames until you get into the really high savings rates, at which point it more or less evens out. This improvement in the safe withdrawal rates is accomplished despite the fact that the returns for the classic 60-40 approach are a fair bit lower than the all-stock strategy which have average 40-year real returns of about 5.3% and 6.8% per year respectively. Why? Because the returns of the classic 60-40 approach is more consistent and less luck-based than the all-stock strategy, and the growth floor of the classic 60-40 approach is quite a bit higher than it is for the all-stock strategy. To put some numbers to it, the classic 60-40 approach has a standard deviation of returns of 11.9%, compared to 18% for the all-stock approach, suggesting that the range of likely returns is much narrower for the classic 60-40 portfolio. Or in other words, the returns are more consistent year to year. The total start date sensitivity for the classic 60-40 portfolio, which looks at the rolling and future returns of an investment over a specific period of time, in this case I'm using every available 10-year time frame since 1927, in order to find the difference between the largest overperforming and underperforming period, was about 23.6%, compared to 35.4% for the all-stock strategy. The average start date sensitivity for all available time periods was 4.8% for the classic 60-40 strategy and 7.6% for the all-stock strategy. This suggests that on average, and at the extremes, the difference historically between the returns of the prior 10 years and the following 10 years has been significantly smaller for the classic 60-40 approach than the all-stock one. This means that, in order to get the returns you would expect to get based on historical return data, you don't need to be nearly as lucky by investing at the right time if you're using a classic 60-40 strategy 
as you would if you were using an all-stock approach. Finally, the classic 60-40 strategy lost money in 27% of years, compared to 32% for the all-stock approach. And the deepest and average inflation-adjusted crash for the classic 60-40 strategy was 36.7% and 13.2%, compared to 55.1% and 18.8% for the all-stock portfolio. Again, this suggests a higher performance floor for the classic 60-40 strategy. I should note that if you're willing and able to utilize some drawdown maximization techniques beyond the asset allocation you choose, such as by cutting your spending in years where your investments are down, the amount of money that you'll need to dedicate towards these stabilizing assets can be adjusted. Similar things about the relative importance of this key could be said if you are in debt or utilizing any kind of leverage with your investments when you start withdrawing from your nest egg. Basically, the more frequently and deeply you're willing and able to cut your expenses during hard times, the less important stabilizing your short-term returns becomes relative to other keys, and vice versa for the more debt and leverage and just risk you're taking on. The third key to maximizing our safe withdrawal rate and minimizing the time it takes to reach financial independence is to dedicate a modest portion of our money towards investments that will protect us from sudden onset and sustained levels of high inflation. The most common way people handle this is by putting some of their money towards hard assets, such as precious metals, especially gold, and real estate. And similar to the stability key, if you're willing and able to utilize other techniques, or expect your personal spending rate to rise faster or slower than the overall inflation rate, you can and probably should alter the relative importance of this key as well but I'll come back to that in a minute. For now, let's look at an allocation that attempts to follow all three of these keys. This portfolio will put 70% of its money towards small cap value stocks, because historically speaking, small cap stocks tend to grow better than their larger counterparts over the long term. 15% of its money will go towards a total bond market index fund, to hopefully give some stability to those small cap returns. And another 15% will go towards gold for that inflation protection. You could also go with real estate, like I said, and many people probably would, given that most people who are entering their drawdown phase their financial life own, or at least plan to own, a home. However, like I said, I don't have a ton of data on REITs before the 1970s, and individual home returns and costs vary way too wildly for it to be very useful in this type of exercise, so I'm just going to be using gold today. This financially independent focused allocation would have supported a minimum 30-year safe withdrawal rate of 5.15% since 1927. The 40 and 50-year rates come in at 4.9 and 4.8% respectively, with a perpetual withdrawal rate of 4.71%. Now, compared Compare that to any of the allocations we've covered today, and especially the permanent portfolio, and you can see that optimizing your asset allocation for financial independence can make quite a difference. On the accumulation side of things, it also posts some of the best numbers across the board, reaching FI more frequently than any other strategy and doing it quicker at each and every level of savings. And what's more, since it manages to produce strong returns with reasonably good consistency and doesn't get totally wrecked during periods of high inflation like we saw in the late 1940s, much of the 1970s, and the early 1990s, 1980s, it tends to scale up well when you start utilizing other drawdown maximization techniques, such as financial guardrails, cash buffers, and flexible spending budgets. For instance, I reran all the simulations for each of the asset allocations assuming that we used financial guardrails, with a 10% adjustment to our projected withdrawal if we ever fall outside of the upper and lower guardrails, which I set to be 20% above or below whatever our initial withdrawal rate happened to be, a spending floor of $30,000 a year, which we're not allowed to go below regardless of what the guardrails say to do, unless our investments have fallen enough for us to use our flexible spending budgets, a flexible spending budget of $24,000 a year, which we'll only use in years where the value of our portfolio has fallen by at least 20% from previous all-time highs, and a two-year cash emergency buffer earning 2% interest, which in this case would be $48,000 in cash on the sidelines since our emergency spending budget is $24,000 a year. Similar to the flexible spending budget, we'll only use this cash when our portfolio has fallen at least 20% from all-time highs. Here's how the numbers came out. You'll notice that even though the all-stock strategy strategy also scaled up pretty well, as most primarily growth-focused strategies do when you're utilizing all of these additional techniques, it wasn't enough to catch up to our FI-optimized approach in any of the metrics. You'll also notice that the permanent portfolio failed to sustain any minimum safe withdrawal rate for the 40- and 50-year scenarios. That's because the $30,000 a year spending floor, which we couldn't go below in most years because the strategy rarely crashed by more than 20%, was enough to drain it before the full 40- and 50-year scenarios were up in some cases. Now again, the price of gold was fixed for a good portion of this time, and that was taking up a full quarter of the portfolio. If that wasn't the case, we may be having a different conversation, but we don't know for sure.
So there you have it. Those are three keys to keep in mind if you're trying to optimize your portfolio for financial independence, either achieving it or just generating the most income you can from it. If you go with something that can deliver strong long-term growth, pair it with something that can bring a reasonable level of consistency to those returns, and protect yourself from inflation, you'll give yourself a pretty darn good shot at success. If you're willing and able to implement some of the techniques people use to supercharge their journey to, or experience with, financial independence, then you might just be setting yourself up for a whole lot more than the standard 3 or 4 percent withdrawals that we typically begin conversations with in this community would lead you to believe. But that'll do it for me today. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button if you haven't already, subscribe, and hit that bell next to my name so you'll be notified of all my future uploads. I generally upload every single Monday, and if you have a friend that would be interested in this kind of content, be sure to share it with them. Let's really get this information out there and start our own financial revolution.